Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're bringing you something I'm very excited about. This is part one of a two-part series to teach you how to play Ether Fields. Now this is a game that, for whatever reason, has given people a lot of trouble learning. Uh, I believe primarily because of the way the rule book's laid out. It's kind of, it feels a little scattershot maybe in some places uh, with rules kind of being here and then also over here. And I, I've tried to gather them all together and, and present them in a way that at least is a bit more uh, intuitive, I hope, and easy to learn. So uh, this video is gonna cover our, the setup and the basic rules, just kind of the, some of the general rules that you need to know to get playing. And then um, part two will cover the gameplay, the, the nitty gritty of the gameplay and actually going through you know, your, your turns in the, in, the, in the dreams and everything like that. So uh, be sure to come back and check for part two. Before we get down to the game topper for me to teach you how to play Etherfields, I do want to mention our sponsor, Board Game Co. This is a great website where you can buy, sell, and trade games. They have a great selection of games for you to choose from if you're looking to build out your collection. If you're looking to trim down your collection, they will buy games from you. Uh, they are always looking to get new games into stock, so definitely check that feature out. And my favorite feature is the trade feature. If you go uh, to Board Game Geek, if you have an account over there, which many of us do, go to Board Game Geek, set up a trade list over there, what you have for trade, what you want in trade, and then go to Board Game Co., type in your Board Game Geek username, and they will compare your trade list with their stock and build a custom trade list right there on their website. It makes it very easy to set up a trade. Uh, I highly recommend it, I've done it myself, very, very easy to use. Board Game Co. makes it easy to buy, sell, and trade your way into a better collection. If you go over there, click on the link in the description below so they know I sent you over there. All right, so let's get down to the game topper and I'm gonna show you how to play Etherfields. Before the first game of a new campaign, each player will choose the archetype they will play during the campaign. It will also be possible to change or exchange this archetype during the game and it's even possible for new players to join the campaign. So don't worry about this choice too much without knowing what the archetypes actually can do. The available archetypes are tough guy, specialist, gambler, and free spirit. After each player selects their archetype, they take that archetype's player board, the associated miniature, the personal token, and the dreamer's starting influence deck. Additionally, players should take one of these cards for reference purposes. Now the setup of the player's first game in a campaign is actually pretty easy. The board itself is not really lit out in any functional way. I don't use the board when I play the game, and to be honest, I don't want to uh, deal with with you know flipping this board out and all kinds of stuff and moving it around and getting the shots right, dealing with the ridiculous way this board is laid out. So I'm not going to use it during this instructional video either. So this can actually be a bit of an instructional video to show you how to play Etherfields without the board. It's actually very intuitive. So the following items, since you're not using a board, you're gonna to wanna to put in a place within easy reach of all players. The turn card deck has 12 turn cards in it and can be placed face down initially. Set the shuffled fate deck out. Shuffle the flaw deck and set it out. Place all of the dice, tokens, and various markers in the general play area. Players will grab these as asked for, and players really should sort them by their individual types. Each player should place their dreamer board in front of them. The influence deck should go here. Players will also notice that many game elements such as item cards, masks, the slumber deck, dream world map tiles, etc. are unused at the very beginning of the player's first game. These will come into play as the game requires them. And that's everything that's required to set up the very first game of a campaign. Now let's discuss how to set up a game more generally and more the way it will be set up throughout the campaign. Again, we'll be doing this without using the actual board included with the game. 
The player should place any note cards or item cards they have in an area designated as the storage. Now, don't confuse storage with in the game box. The storage is an area that the players have access to during the game itself and may draw cards from. The game box is an entirely different thing. And when an item or note card or any other card should be in the game box, that will be indicated as such. Players likely will have a deck of item cards and active items will be drawn a little bit later. As I run through different types of cards and components during this instructional video, I will attempt to keep spoilers to a minimum. Many of these things you will not have when you first begin the game. And for those things, I will try to show you the earliest version of it that you acquire in order to keep the spoilers as minimal as possible. If some things don't seem to quite make sense or it feels like a rule or two are being left out, that's because that will be specifically handled in game. While this video is instead simply teaching you the general ideas that you need to recognize these cards and components when they first show up. If the players have season cards, they should be placed out with the current season on top. Season cards are not shuffled. The slumber deck should be placed out with the slumber deck shuffled and the delta phase green slumber card on the bottom of the deck. The slumber map tile deck should be placed out. And then the turn cards, fate cards, and flaw cards should be placed out as previously mentioned. The dream world map tiles are placed out. And if you're not using the board, then you're gonna want to understand the grid. The letters are for the row. So row A, row B. The numbers are the column. So this is column two. There could be a card here, A1 and B1, and then A3 and B3, and A4 and B4. This is the hour marker. If you're not using the board to keep track of the hours, then what I recommend is a regular six-sided die, since six is the maximum number of hours a player can accumulate. And if you have, say, four hours, place it on top of the marker like this. And then you can rotate it down or up as necessary. And what I'd usually do is if I'm out of hours, if I have zero hours, I place the marker on top of the die like this. When a player is initially setting up the number of hours, a solo player will get five hours. If there are two players, four hours, three players, three hours, and four players get two hours. To be clear, this is based off the number of dreamers, not necessarily the number of players. So if one player is controlling two dreamers, then they would get four hours. If the players have unlocked the sign tokens, then they would place these near the playing area. Sign tokens that are assigned to specific dreamers will only be used by those dreamers and can be placed near that dreamer's board instead of the general play area. This envelope is used to keep all the player's dream gates that are not yet removed from the game. The players may remove all the dream tiles from this envelope and consult them before deciding where to go on the dream world map next. When a wisdom card is gained, it is always placed in this holder and players may consult all the wisdom cards in this holder at any time. The influence market may be left in the box as well as the item market. However, they both should be shuffled. All secret cards and secret tiles should be left in the box as well and should never be looked at until specifically told to do so. It's also important that they stay in their current order. Any masks not acquired by a dreamer may also be left in the box. Players now choose the first player and provide them with the first player token. Players will now resolve the awakening wisdom card starting with step four. During step nine, when it says that players should place the two starting slumber map tiles out, the players then also place their dreamer on any space that has this symbol. In this case, either of these spaces. So a few more things about wisdom cards. Due to the nature of ether fields, many of the rules for the game are not revealed when the player begins the campaign. New rules are revealed in the form of wisdom cards. These revealed wisdom cards are placed in the holder as we've discussed. 
and it can hold up to nine on each side. So once I fill up that side, I'll start having them face up on this side. These are face down, obviously, to prevent spoilers. And just to reiterate, all Revealed Wisdom cards are always considered active. It should be noted that not always, but many times in ether fields, the flavor text on cards actually does contain useful tips or hints about what should happen. These are all starting influence cards from the Free Spirits deck, so this flavor text, probably not so much, but as the players reveal more and more secret cards, they should definitely pay attention to the flavor text. During the dreamer's phase of a slumber or dream, the first player will be the first to act during each card and action step. Play will then continue clockwise from there. Anytime the game instructs the player to do something and there are several options, such as moving an entity when there are several possible paths, then the dreamers choose an option as a group. So if this entity was gonna move one space, and they were moving towards the dreamer, they could move here or here, and the group would have to decide. Also, anytime the dreamers have to make a group decision and they can't come to a consensus on what should happen, the first player has the final word. At the start of a new turn during a slumber or dream, or after resolving a location on the dream world map, the players may pass the first player token. This is optional, however, and if the players have no trouble making decisions as a group, they may keep the same first player the entire time. During the campaign, the player will play a variety of slumbers and dreams. In between these slumbers and dreams, players will be traveling along the dream world map and resolving various locations. A typical game session will have the players playing through several slumbers and one dream. Anytime a rule on a card, tile, or script contradicts the rulebook, the rule on that card, tile, or script always takes precedence. This icon indicates the players should reference the player count in the game, meaning the number of dreamers. So if one player is controlling multiple dreamers, the player count will be higher than the actual number of players. And it should not be confused with this icon, which is a gradual action, and we'll discuss gradual actions more a little later. The slash symbol seen here between these icons means or. Each dream has its own goal. Sometimes this is clearly stated on the dream gate tile, but sometimes there might only be a hint. Also, each dreamer will discover more about themselves during the campaign, unveiling their own forgotten story and developing their character in many ways. When entering a slumber or dream, the team marker is left exactly where it is on the dream world map. The situation on the dream world map is paused until dreamers end the slumber or dream they've just entered. After resolving that slumber or dream, the players will return to the team marker on the dream world map and continue exactly where they left off. So let's discuss the difference between slumbers and dreams. Slumbers are simple, short adventures in which the main feature is usually an encounter with an entity of some kind. Slumbers are played on the slumber map. This is the back of the slumber map that you will initially start with. Most of the time, these slumbers will involve only a single entity. Each slumber entity tile contains a small setup section up here and the conditions the player must fulfill to win here. Dreams are longer expanded adventures, each of which have their own unique dreamscape created with specific tiles from the Secret Tiles deck. These tiles can be identified by the unique code on their back, which is referenced on the Dream Gate tile. Not only will dreams reference secret tiles, but usually secret cards with the same code as well. Inside these dreams, players will find unique entities that they may not have encountered previously. Moving on the dream world map does not cost anything the way it does inside an actual dream. Players just choose one of the paths. In this case, there's a path here and a path there. And move the team marker to the next location. After entering a location, the players resolve its effects. If there is more than one effect, resolve them one by one from left to right. So in this case, draw and resolve a fate card, then draw and resolve a slumber tile. 
There are no turns in the Dream World map. Players simply move the team marker to the next location, resolve its effects, and do it again until they enter a slumber or a dream. When that happens, players then move to the more complex and detailed Dreamscape map, where they'll use minis of their dreamers. Players will receive a wisdom card that will instruct them on what all of these different icons do. Besides the standard paths, which are these big arrows, there are also these smaller arrows, which are shortcuts. When the player wants to travel through a shortcut, they have to pay the price. The shortcut effect is different for each Dream World map tile, and it's described on the tile itself. In this case, each dreamer flips or seals one card. Just like paths, shortcuts can only be traveled in the direction the arrow indicates. Anytime players take a shortcut from one Dream World map tile to another, they resolve the shortcut effect in the tile that they started on. Influence cards and items are mostly used in Slumbers and Dreams and not on the Dream World map. There are a few exceptions, however. Some of the influence or item cards are in fact specific to the Dream World map or affect the resolution of location effects. And then some cards, though not specifically reserved to the Dream World map, can be played if they have an effect which may be useful, such as rerolls. These may also be used when resolving a fake card. Essentially, if the player can find a use for an influence card or item, they may use it in the Dream World map. All of the once per turn actions or effects can be used only once during each travel between slumbers or dreams on the Dream World map. It should be noted that since there is no draw step in the Dream World map, players will have to have these cards already in their hands or in their progress zone in order to use them. When not using the board, it can be a little tricky to properly line up the Dreamscape map, so let's take a look at that for a moment. You can see here the card is hanging off to the side and same over here a little bit. The key is to line up these icons. A2 will always be directly above B2. A3 directly above B3. A2 and A3 are going to be one space apart and so on. As long as you remember that those are your guideposts, then you should have little difficulty properly lining everything up. Let's discuss some of the iconography players will encounter on the Slumber and Dream maps. This is a shining gem slot. These allow any dreamer in the same space as the icon to spend one gem and place it on the icon. This immediately activates the effect described next to the icon. Anytime a player is in a space that already has a shining gem placed on it, they may take that gem if they wish, but that will deactivate the effect. Trap icons are triggered when a dreamer moves through its space or ends their movement on the space. They also trigger if the dreamer is relocated onto the space. These effects are detailed in the instructions for that particular slumber or dream, and if the trap effect is not described anywhere, then it has no effect. Flying rules are found in blue frames like this. They are not related to a specific space even if they are found in one. Instead, they relate to the entire dreamscape. If such a frame contains an action, the dreamer may take it regardless of where on the map they are. If the frame contains instructions, they should be resolved as soon as the flying rule is revealed. This drawing bonus indicates that at the start of the dreamer's phase, if the dreamer is in a space with this bonus, they draw an additional number of cards equal to whatever the number is shown. As you can see here, there is no number, but there will be in actual gameplay. The stairs icon doesn't have any effect unless another card or rule specifically indicates that it does. One use icons indicate the map action associated with it may only be used once. After its use, the player should block it with this token. Blocked actions may not be used. Terrain symbols, like this one, don't have any effect unless another card or rule says they do. When a terrain symbol is at the center of a map tile like this, then all four spaces are considered as having the symbol. If it's between two spaces like this, then both of those spaces have that symbol. If it's in a single space like this one, then only that space has it. Terrain tokens follow these same rules but may be placed out on the board based on certain effects or cards during the game. 
If a space ever has both night and day terrain symbols, then the night symbol is ignored. The possible terrain symbols are darkness, light, water, and swamp. This question mark icon means players need to draw and resolve the top card from the fate deck. After resolving it, unless otherwise stated, place it at the bottom of the fate deck. Some fate cards instruct players to draw one slumber map tile and then place the slumber map tile into the dreamscape. Then if there is an empty cork space, place that fate card in that space. As you can see, cork card slot right there. So this will go here. Fate cards with these instructions are named cork cards. If there were no empty quirk spaces, then this quirk card would have been discarded to the bottom of the deck as usual. In fact, anytime a quirk card is discarded for any reason, it is always placed at the bottom of the fate deck. Whenever a player should gain or place an element and there is not enough left in the pool, that element simply is not gained or placed. The one exception is distress. If a dreamer should gain distress and there is not any left, then all dreamers immediately fail. At specific moments of the game, the player will go through a deck building step, allowing the player to add or remove cards from their influence deck. The player always needs to check the number of cards in their deck during this step to ensure that it's within the deck limits of 20 minimum and 40 maximum cards. On the rare occasion that players possess less than 20 influence cards, they must use all the cards they possibly can to get as close to 20 as possible. The player may never have more than 40 influence cards in their deck. Unused cards should be placed back in the box behind the dreamer's divider and may not be used again until the next deck building step. Now, if the player's deck drops below 20 or exceeds 40 during the game for any reason, nothing happens immediately. The number is only checked during the deck building portions of the game. When deck building, players must add all flaw cards they currently possess to their deck. These flaw cards do not count towards the minimum 20 or maximum 40 card limit. The player's hand may never have more than six cards in it at any time. When drawing cards, the player only draws until they have at most six cards. But players also never draw more than four cards at a time. There are some special rules that may modify the hand size limit. However, it's important to note that a bonus that allows players to draw additional cards does not modify the hand size limit itself. Influence cards represent all the abilities and powers in the dreamer's arsenal. With the exception of progress influence cards, which may be used while in the active progress zone, players may only ever play influence cards from their hand. Also, unless otherwise specified, the player may only play influence cards during their round of the dreamer's phase. Cards with this lightning bolt icon are the exception to that rule. These may be played during other dreamer rounds as well as during the dreamscape phase. Also, if the dreamer is taking an action that occurs outside of their turn, they may discard influence cards for the intent needed to pay for that action as well. On an influence card, players will find the amount and types of intent this card may be played to gain, the ether cost to purchase this card from the market, the cost of the action or effect on the card. Most actions, as you see here, will have zero cost. Any additional requirements for the action or effect will also be listed here. And the action or effect itself. Also, each dreamer's unique starting deck has its own special feature printed on the back. Anytime a card with this ability is on top of the dreamer's influence deck, that dreamer may perform it. If the player ever gains a new influence card, it is placed on top of the discard pile. If playing solo, the player may find certain cards aren't really designed for solo play. In that case, the player may remove the card from the game and draw another. Actions and effects on progress cards cannot be used when the card is in the player's hand. Instead, the player must first place the card into the progress zone by paying its placement cost and then sliding it just under the dreamer board like this. A dreamer may have a maximum of four progress cards in their progress zone at any one time. Players cannot discard a progress card from the progress zone 
for its intent. Sometimes players will be told to flip a card, which means they must flip a placed progress card face down. The flipped card's action cannot be used until the player unflips it. However, flipped cards do still count toward the progress card limit. If the player wanted to place a new progress card when they've already reached the limit, they first must discard one of their placed progress cards. This card may be active or it may be one of the flipped cards. This is the only way a player may voluntarily discard a placed progress card. Some rules refer to this symbol. This symbol indicates the number of the player's active progress cards of that color. So in this case, what this player could do is seal this card, and then it, let's say they had two green progress cards in their progress zone. They could then draw three total top cards from their discard pile. Sealing cards is one of the most common negative effects in the game. When a player is instructed to seal a number of cards, they reveal the indicated number, let's say one in this case, of influence cards from the top of the deck and place them in the sealed pile face down. Players can use the mask to keep track of which face down deck is their sealed pile. Cards that are sealed are now unavailable until the player manages to unseal them. The unseal ability allows the player to take the indicated number of cards from the top of their sealed pile and place them back into their discard pile. So let's say the player could unseal three cards. They would take one, two, and three cards and place them in their discard pile. It's important to keep in mind that only influence cards may be sealed. Other cards, such as flaw cards, cannot. If a player were to draw a flaw card while sealing, they would set it aside, and then after resolving the seal effect, place the drawn flaw card back on top of their influence deck. The influence market is a pool of unacquired influence cards placed face down in their dedicated slot in the box. When the game instructs the player to buy cards from the influence market, they should draw the top three cards from this deck. Now, I'm not going to show these to you because of spoilers, but you would, of course, look at them at this point. The player may buy any number of these cards and then return the rest to the bottom of the influence market. Unless otherwise stated, anytime the game tells players to buy influence cards, each dreamer in player order may buy them at this moment, with each dreamer drawing three cards from the market. When a player does buy an influence card, it is placed in their discard pile. Anytime a player is instructed to return a card to the influence market, they have lost it and will go in the back or bottom of the influence market. The same goes for if items are to be returned to the item market. As you can see, it's possible that a dreamer's starting cards may end up in the influence market. And if that's the case, it's also possible that other dreamers may have the opportunity to buy these cards, which is entirely legal. Many cards and effects require the use of the luck die. The effect of the roll will be indicated on the component instructing the player to roll. If the result of the roll isn't specifically indicated on that component, then nothing happens. Many effects also allow the player to re-roll a die result. There is no limit to the number of re-rolls the player can perform as long as they can pay the required cost and or meet the conditions necessary. When making a re-roll, the only result that may be used is the current roll. Previous rolls are completely ignored. Each dreamer may only wear one mask at a time and it is considered their active mask. Once a dreamer selects their active mask, they may only change it out when the game states they are allowed to. A dreamer is allowed to use the ability on the back of their mask at any time. Any unused masks are put back into the box. However, they won't fit behind the dreamer dividers, so instead the players may use these cards to keep track of which masks belong to them. When a player is instructed to restore a mask, they may replace their active mask with another mask they own. When a player is instructed to discard their mask, their current mask ceases to be active and it is put back into the box. When a player gains a new mask, they may immediately put it into play, replacing their current mask. Active items can be used by any dreamer either for their actions and effects, or they can be discarded as intent to pay for other actions. 
Players may have a maximum of three active items at a time. All other items currently owned by the Dreamers are placed into a single face-down deck in the storage area. If a player is instructed to restore an item, they draw one random item from the item deck and then place it into one of their three active item slots. If they already have three active items, they must discard one prior to placing the new one. If instead the player does not want to place the new active item, they may discard it instead. Anytime an item is discarded, it's placed face down on the bottom of the item deck. And as previously mentioned, if an item is returned to the item market, it's placed at the bottom of the item market deck. Anytime a player gains a new item, they may immediately place it into play if they wish. Flaw cards inflict various negative effects and penalties. The player will sometimes be instructed by the game to add some of these to their influence deck. When instructed to gain a flaw card, the player draws it from the top of the flaw deck and places it on the top of their discard pile. Anytime the player draws a flaw card from their influence deck, they must immediately resolve it. Most flaw cards include a method for removing it from the player's influence deck. In this case, the player must discard one ether to remove the card. Anytime the player removes a flaw card from their influence deck, it is placed at the bottom of the flaw deck. Remember, anytime a player is building their influence deck, they must include any flaw cards that are currently in their possession in the build of the deck. Also remember that those flaw cards do not count towards the minimum or maximum card limit of the influence deck. It's also possible that some flaw cards may end up in the active progress zone. These flaw cards do not count toward the progress card limit of the player. Dreamers and entities may be affected by various states. The state's effect is detailed on its token. The four states are paralyzed, stunned, poisoned, and dazed. State tokens only affect the specific entity mini or token on which it was played. If the state token should ever be played, but none remain of that state, then the state is not played. So there you go. That's part one of our two-part Etherfield series. This is, uh, you know, like I said, as you saw during the video, the setup and the basic rules. Come back for part two when we're going to cover all of the other rules you need to know to play either builds. Be sure to check out our other channel, Video Game Relapse, where we're covering right now. We're playing through Witcher 3, having a lot of fun doing that. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline. <laughs>